It was only a couple of weeks ago that Donald Trump supporters told us not to believe our lying ears when Donald Trump said this. We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. Relax. He wasn't talking about a bloodbath bloodbath. He was just talking about a bloodbath for the country involving the auto industry. Trump's allies told us that. Political analysts told us that. Heck, even some journalists told us, told us that. Okay, so Trump was referring to cars yesterday, or was he, in Michigan when he spoke at a lectern bearing the words, stop Biden's border bloodbath? It was during those remarks that Trump claimed he spoke with the family of a murder victim named Ruby Garcia, a 25-year-old woman who was allegedly killed by an undocumented immigrant. Except he didn't. He did not speak with any of us, Ruby's sister Marvi Garcia said in an interview. So it's kind of shocking seeing that he had said he had spoken with us, misinforming people on live TV, end quote. NBC News reports when asked to confirm if Trump had indeed spoken with a member of Ruby Garcia's family, the Trump campaign declined to comment on the record. Now, this specific deception feeds into the violent, dehumanizing way that Trump uses the issue of immigration to try to terrorize his way back to the Oval Office. Trump wants you to believe that we live in a violent, treacherous nation where his political rivals are vermin, and he alone, as he says it, stands between you and an invasion of animals, also his words, at the border. This playbook is tried and true the world over. It depends on people not reading history and knowing that this dupe has been tried and has worked masterfully before. But forget about history for the moment. Let's just rewind to what Trump said about immigrants in this country in December. You know, when they let, I think the real number is 15, 16 million people into our country, when they do that, we got a lot of work to do. They're poisoning the blood of our country. Now, you've heard plenty of people tell you that Trump was echoing the words of Adolf Hitler there. Maybe you don't believe that. Maybe you don't think he really did that. Maybe you think it's just a coincidence that Trump used the phrase poisoning the blood of our country. But none of that would be true. For educational purposes, the University of Oklahoma has available online an English language translation of the 11th chapter of Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Remember now, Trump said people immigrating into the United States were poisoning the blood of our country. In Chapter 11 of Mein Kampf, a chapter titled Nation and Race, Hitler wrote, quote, all great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning. In a softball right-wing radio interview, Trump was confronted about this, and he said, quote, I never knew that Hitler said it. I know nothing about Hitler. I'm not a student of Hitler. I never read his works, end quote. Never read his works. Now, remember that Trump has not shied away from saying great things about other autocrats and strongmen. He said Hungary's despotic le leader, Viktor Orban, is fantastic. He called North Korea's murderous dictator, Kim Jong-un, very honorable. Trump threw the entire Western alliance into a tailspin when, as president of the United States of America, he denigrated the work of his own intelligence community and parroted Vladimir Putin's criticisms of the United States. America's decades-long subjection to Donald Trump is littered with hateful and violent words and actions. Donald Trump has refused still to apologize for taking out full-page newspaper ads in four New York City newspapers in 1989, calling for the death penalty for the Central Park Five, five black and Latino men who were wrongfully convicted as teenagers for the rape of the New York City jogger. As a candidate in 2016, Donald Trump said he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and not lose any voters. In that same campaign, he promised to pay the legal bills of any of his supporters who beat up protesters at his rallies. On his inauguration day, he gave a dystopian and ominous speech invoking the phrase American carnage. As president, Donald Trump said there were, quote, very fine people on both sides, end quote, after an innocent woman was murdered in Charlottesville, Virginia, during a riot between demonstrators and neo-Nazis. The night before that deadly riot, 
those same white supremacists marched through the campus of the University of Virginia with torches, chanting, Jews will not replace us, and blood and soil, which is an English translation of a Nazi slogan. At a presidential debate in 2020 against Joe Biden, Donald Trump, as president, told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. At his rallies, Donald Trump is calling those jailed for the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol patriots. Those imprisoned are hostages. The same people who pledged to hang Mike Pence, who repeatedly assaulted and threatened to kill Capitol police officers, who built a gallows with a noose outside the Capitol building and desecrated the halls of Congress. Today, a federal judge sentencing a man convicted of assaulting law enforcement said, we cannot condone the normalization of the January 6th U.S. Capitol riot. But condone that violence is exactly what Donald Trump and the Republican Party are doing. This week, Donald Trump, the presidential nominee of the party of Abraham Lincoln, had to be gagged by a New York judge after making threatening attacks against the judge's daughter. Here's the thing. Violence is who Donald Trump is. He uses violent words, wielding them like weapons in his effort to hold on to power and make you afraid of him, of the others, of the immigrants. It doesn't matter as long as you are afraid. But it doesn't have to be this way. You shouldn't give over your fear to Donald Trump, but you also can't ignore him. He counts on the fact that some will follow him into the fire of his creation, but most will look away in horror, hoping time will make it all go away. Time will not make it all go away. Throughout this nation's history, many wise Americans have offered wisdom in the face of political violence. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people who will bomb a church in Birmingham, Alabama, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. In other words, things don't get better for those who wait. Things only get better for those who act. Joyce, let me start with you. I, I read a lot of legal terminology, um, but there is this talk of a writ, there is talk of jeopardy, and there is this discussion by Jack Smith to say, please make whatever decision you're going to make now, because if you don't do it now, we have a problem. What, what did he mean? Right. So here's the problem that happens with Eileen Cannon's refusal to issue a ruling on Trump's motion to dismiss under the Presidential Records Act. The reason Jack Smith says he's entitled to a decision now is that if she rules against him, he can appeal that in advance. He can go to the 11th Circuit and, and ask them to second guess. A and the reality here is that virtually every legal expert who's not in the Trump camp who's looked at this issue says the Presidential Records Act has nothing to do with whether or not someone is illegally in possession of classified national defense information. So it seems pretty clear that the judge is in error territory. She's trying to delay ruling on that motion until after the trial starts. And here's why that matters. Once the jury is sworn in, double jeopardy attaches. And if she dismisses the case in Trump's favor after double jeopardy attaches, Jack Smith can't appeal her. He can't retry the case because the government can only try a defendant one time on a set of charges. And so what she's essentially trying to do here is to protect Trump, to insulate him behind a decision that she would make after the jury was impaneled when the government couldn't try him again and defeating the government's right to appeal. Jack Smith has finally decided to get tough and he said, look, the clock is ticking here. He hasn't told her how much time she has, but he said, I need my ruling before we go to trial. And if I don't get it, I'll man damn you and ask the court to order you to rule correctly. Which has not gone her way a couple of times in the past. Uh, Neil, part of the problem, uh, and, and there, there are two issues here. One is the argument that, that Jack Smith makes about the Presidential Records Act. But the other one is this idea that the judge 
seems to be considering giving the jury an instruction that would be counter to the law. Um, it's it's just that the instruction that she's considering about a president can do X, Y, and Z is not actually how the law is written. It's not a vague law about the Presidential Records Act. That's exactly right, Ali. And so what Smith did is take both of your points and basically say, you know, in legal terms, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. But it all boils down to, look, Judge Cannon, we've had enough, enough already. And basically saying to her, you're getting this totally wrong and you're delaying things and you're risking a double jeopardy acquittal. And so they used some very stern language and warned her, as Joyce says, that we are going to mandamus you, which means to say you were so clearly wrong, we're going to take this to an immediate appeal to the 11th Circuit and possibly even seek your removal as a judge in this case. Now, when I ran the Solicitor General's office, which is the office that controls all federal appeals, I had prosecutors from across the country that would come to me and ask for that and say, look, this judge is totally out of line. Don't let, don't, you know, we, we have to file this piece of paper, this mandamus and the like. And almost always we would say no. The typical thing of the Justice Department is be patient, let the system play out. But when you have a judge who's repeatedly erred the way this judge has, enough is enough. And in those rare circumstances, and it sure looks like this is one, that's when you seek mandamus and you possibly even seek the removal of a judge. That is something you do only as a very last resort. But unfortunately, Ali, we are at that stage. And so Smith's filing says, look, kids' gloves are off now. Uh -huh. We've been as patient as we possibly can with you, Judge, but this is it. Professor Snyder, I, I, you and I have just talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, but I think it was important to come back because Donald Trump on a daily basis now is doing things that shock those of us who don't think we can be further shocked. And the question is not that you shouldn't be shocked by it. It's what you are supposed to do about it. Uh, we were talking just this weekend about how he posted a picture of a truck that was decorated, uh, wrapped to look like Joe Biden uh, with a bullet in his head was hogtied in the bed of that truck. Some people say you're making too much of that kind of thing. What's the danger of normalizing this? Yeah, I, I, the, the problem is what Trump is doing is he's changing what is normal. He's getting us used to the idea that violent words, violent phrases, indirect threats, stochastic violence, that this is all, this is normal. And of course, our whole political system is based on the idea that you can have a constitution, a social contract, an agreement to hand over power peacefully. And so what one has to be able to do is to say, this is the kind of person who, if elected or who gets close to power, will automatically undo the system. And that's what one has to understand and be calm about it and make that a reason to make sure that this person doesn't get close to power. Get close to power is an interesting term. You made a reference to this in a recent article uh, that you wrote on your Substack. Getting close to power is not the same as winning power. Uh, you, you've made the point that Donald Trump is setting up a situation in which on November 5th, he doesn't actually have to win more votes than, than Joe Biden to achieve his goals. I don't think in any of these elections in 16 or 20 or 24, Trump has ever believed that he was going to win. And every single time he said in one in one version or another that it was going to be stacked against him, people were going to cheat, it was going to be rigged against him. I don't think he has ever actually had the notion that he was going to win the popular or the electoral vote. I think each time, but now with increasing violence and I think an increasing fervor and fear on his side, he's just tried to get close enough that he could stage something. I think he was genuinely surprised in 2000, in 2016 when he won. I think he was not surprised in 20 when he lost. He was ready for that. He'd been advertising for months that he was going to try something if he failed to win. And this time he's made it clearer than ever. He's making it very clear to us that his whole game is to just get reasonably close in November and then see what he can try to pull off. So we have more time to make sure that he doesn't get reasonably close. And also we have more time to try to head off the various extra legal things he could try in November. So let's, and, and you talk about this and you say, let's be calm. 
which is good. We don't have to, we don't have to lose, you know, our hair, hair doesn't have to be on fire about this. But you can't do nothing. You can't wish it away. You can't decide because you don't like to hear Donald Trump's voice that you shouldn't hear what he's got to say. So what's your guidance for people who really don't want to listen to Donald Trump? They don't, they don't believe they're going to vote for him. They don't believe he's going to win the election. What is the thing that we're called upon to do other than vote on November 5th? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, the most important thing is to do something also because of your mood, because what Trump is trying to do, among other things, is to demoralize everybody. He's trying to make everything seem dirty. He's trying to make politics seem dirty. He's trying to make the good people seem just like him. You know, his whole strategy or part of his strategy is to try to make the Biden administration seem just like a version of him. Everybody's bad. So just pick your flavor of bad. But when you yourself do something good, some little thing, letter to the editor of the newspaper, conversation with somebody at a bar, phone banking, calling your congressman about legislation, any little thing that you do, campaigning for candidates that you care about, giving, donating money to people, especially down ballot, any little thing that you do then makes you feel better, especially if you do it with other people. And then you get a positive cycle going where you're doing something good and you're feeling better about doing something good. And then at the end, you win, but also you know that there are lots of people around you who are also trying to do good things. And so you, you end up on the right side, but then you're not demoralized. You're actually, you're happy at the end of it, something like that. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about journalism. Um, you, you've got you know, this is a time when we should be introspective. We should be trying to, to, to get this as right as we can. Uh, what are the things that we should be doing now in in light of the fact that Donald Trump crosses new red lines on a daily basis? What's the way in which we cover this properly and provide the necessary context without being gratuitous or 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 creating unnecessary fear? Yeah. And number one is good old fashioned, just covering what the man says and does. I don't think there has been enough. And we talked about this last time. I don't think there's been enough simple coverage of the rallies. People need to know that the rallies begin with um, an appeal to people who have been convicted of crimes. They need to know that the rallies begin from the premise that there should be a violent overthrow of the American system. That's how every single rally begins. And I don't think people know that. The second thing is I, journalists have to accept that both sidesism is suicide for democracy. If you just say there are two sides to everything and I'm going to find my way into the middle, you're always going to give the people who want to overthrow the system an advantage because you're always going to be sharing your legitimacy with them. You're going to be giving your legitimacy to them. People have to be able to cover the election in such a way as to say this person is A and this person is B, as opposed to I'm going to somehow find my way into the middle of them and give each side a voice. And it's really important, this is a third thing, not to talk about how the American people are divided. That makes it sound like, again, it's like one thing, one hand, mm -hmm. other hand. It's not the people who are divided. It's that we have an extraordinary election in which we have an unusual candidate who has already tried to overthrow the system once and tells us basically every day that he's just aiming to get close enough that he can use violence to overthrow it again. That's what should be covered. Tim, we always appreciate it. Thank you for your continuing analysis. And I think we're going to have to have this conversation several more times before uh, November. Timothy Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and an author of a number of important books that are uniquely relevant. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.